I, I imagine a few more people will start to stream in, but why don't we get started? Can I get some verbal feedback that you're able to see my screen? Yes, yes, Perfect. Okay. Thank you. All right. So welcome to the very last section, the very last meeting for 194A, which is uh, a class about the fundamentals of Android here at Stanford. So um, I I'm really excited to get into the panel discussion and have the chance to interact with these really amazing Android engineers. But before that, I wanted to spend just a minute or two to recap what we've done in this class. So we've been meeting now, this is the ninth meeting. And for most of you coming in, you had never worked with Android. And certainly, I don't think anyone had really worked with Kotlin before, which is the language we used to build out the apps um, in this class. But throughout these past nine weeks, you've been able to build out three really full featured apps, I would say. So we had the tip calculator for the first assignment. Then we built out a clone of Google My Maps, which allows you to save locations that you've been to or locations that you want to go to. And then third, we learned how to work with APIs in Android. And we talked to the Yelp API to build out a Yelp clone. And based on where we started the class up until now, I think all of you should be really proud. I'm really proud of the progress that each of you have made to build out three essentially portfolio pieces that you can go out and use to get an internship or a full-time position um, in Android or even in other domains of engineering. We even had Shi Wen, who I think is on the call, she published her Yelp clone. And so if you actually search for, I think it's called Yelp search, but correct me if I'm wrong, Shi Wen, but if you Google for that in the Play Store, then you should be able to find her app. I downloaded it two days ago when I gave it a five-star review. So I mean, I'm, I'm really impressed overall with how much progress everyone has made um, in building out these apps. So with that, I want to have this last section, this last class be an an, a chance for all of you to be able to ask questions to people who have been doing Android for years now. And so I'm really excited to have Jake, Shasha, Don, and Alex to be here and spend about an hour and a half with us to talk through their experience. And I, and I think you'll find that you know, they have actually pretty diverse experiences in, in arriving to what they're doing today, but they all have a lot of wisdom to share. So I'm going to start out by asking each panelist to just go around and introduce themselves. Before that, though, logistically, um, the way I want to do this is that if you have a question, then put it in the chat. And then what I'll do is I have a few questions. I have about four questions I want to ask, and I'll get through those. And I'm going to make sure there's plenty of time for each of you, the students, to be able to interact with our panelists. So put it in the chat and then I'll pause periodically and I'll, I'll ask people who have written a question down in the chat to ask their question. Make sense? Okay, so um, I'm gonna ask, starting with Jake, to just give us a quick intro of who you are. And in particular, just tell us a story of how you arrived at what you're doing today. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can actually see you live and center. Okay, so Jake, go ahead. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Jake. I work at Square for the second time, uh, recently restarted. Uh, I've also worked at Google for a little stint. Um, I got to where I'm at. Uh, Android was a, a hobby project for me, like a side project thing that I played with uh, because it, it used Java and I did Java as part of my day job. And also, uh, even while I was in school, and for like five years or something, I just occasionally would play with it on the side. Uh, and I kind of accidentally struck gold with uh, a library. I, I wanted to build an app and I needed this thing. Uh, so I built a library for the thing and I never actually got around to building the app. Uh, and the library sort of became a little popular and sucked up a ton of my time. And uh, through that, I started going to conferences and met some people and found out that you know I could actually be paid full time to work on Android, which at the time was this like insane concept to me. Uh, and so when I sort of found a company that I thought was a, a decent match, or at least one that I had knew, that I knew uh, a little bit of, I basically just took that I, I took their offer and uh, I've been doing Android full time ever since. And I'm, I'm going to take the opportunity also to embellish each person a little bit. Um, so we built out this Yelp clone in the class. And the students will know, we used a library called Retrofit. 
And so Jake is actually one of the core contributors of Retrofit. So we have the opportunity right now to talk to him, this person who, who built out a lot of this library that we used. Um, so yeah, so Jake, thank, thanks for being here. Um, and then I think next on the list was Shasha. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Shasha. I'm the Android platform tech lead at Pinterest. Um, I've been at Pinterest for almost five years. Uh, I, I had kind of a meandering path to, to Android. Um, I started out my career in game development. Um, I worked at EA for like between one and 1,000 years. It was a very long time. Um, and then uh, ap w when I decided to leave EA, I left for a small mobile games company. Um, and that company had put out sort of some kind of like moderately successful iOS uh, games and they were looking to start building on Android. Um, and this was in 2009, I think. Um, and they were having a really hard time basically finding anyone who had any Android experience. Um, and so they decided to hire someone that they thought was competent and could learn Android. Um, and so my first experience with Android was actually in games. Um, and 2009 Android is actually a very difficult platform for games. I think now you have, you know, Unity and much powerful, uh, much more powerful devices, but it was pretty rough then. Um, I stayed at that company for about a year um, and then left to go kind of back to a more kind of traditional engineering job um, at a company called OnLive that was doing game streaming. Uh, that company went under um, and then so I was kind of looking around for my next role and uh, at that point, you know, I had become an Android user, um, you know, since that first Android job. And I decided that I wanted to go back um, into Android development because um, career wise, it felt like it was kind of a smart move. And, you know, it was a, a platform that I used every day. Um, and so I thought it would be fun to work on. Uh, so I, I joined Pinterest um, just sort of through their regular interview process. And then I picked a team that I knew would kind of let me work on Android. Um, and sort of from there, it was kind of a combination of determination and dumb luck that I ended up being the tech lead. Um, I think I just sort of showed up and started fixing things. <laughs> and then <laughs> people thought that was, I guess they were pretty happy with that. So um, I, I'm actually the first person in this role um, that, they created a role of platform tech lead for each of the three major clients. Um, and so I'm the first Android one. And so essentially I'm just uh, in charge of the general technical direction of the platform at Pinterest. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I had the opportunity to work with Shasha when I was at Pinterest. And I, and I can say that she, um, any of the design decisions, any of the core design decisions are on Pinterest Android app, you can either attribute to Sasha or blame on Sasha. So uh, I, I, think, I think you have a really good ability to talk about how it is to work in a relatively large code base with dozens of engineers. So that's Sasha. Okay. And I think Don, I think you're next in the list. Yeah, sounds good. My name's Don. Uh, thanks again for having me. I appreciate it, Rahul. Uh, so my background is kind of, I just kind of stumbled into Android uh, around 2008 when the G1, which is the first Android phone that came out, I was able to get my hands on one. Uh, I had been developing software for web and various different backend servers for uh, close to a decade at that point and um, just happened to get my hands on a phone and decided to just tinker with it. I was consulting at the time and in between clients and just started building a few apps and uh, just started publishing them. This is back in the day um, early on when you could just publish an app and basically hit refresh on the screen and your app was visible right then in the Android market at the time. Uh, fast forward, I'm continuing to develop apps for fun on the side. And then I just start speaking at a few conferences and kind of writing a lot about it on my blog. And then a publisher approaches me to start um, to, to write a book for them uh, regarding Android. And so I ended up writing a few books for Android at that point in time and didn't really get my first full-time gig until about three years later in 2011 when I submitted a pull request to uh, another open source library. And the author of that was actually the only engineer over at Groupon. And so I came on as a second Android engineer at Groupon very early on. And ever since then, I've been working full-time on Android. 
Nice. And I feel like Don has done so much that he actually neglected to mention that he also created uh, probably the most popular or one of the most popular Android podcasts out there, the Fragmented Podcast. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you can share stats about it, but certainly that's how I found about Don. And I think many, many Android engineers listen to that podcast regularly. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. It's uh, my co-host. My co-host and I, uh, Kaushik, uh, been running the podcast since 2015. So thank you for listening uh, and so forth. Yeah. And I think the other reason I think Don is, has a really valuable perspective is that as Stanford students, I think so many students will go on to work in a Silicon Valley company, but you know, you have the traditional nine to five, you get a paycheck, you get equity. I think Don's perspective around doing consulting and freelance, I think will be really valuable. Um, and we can talk more about that later. Yeah, no problem. Well, and then Alex, can you give your intro? Alex, you're, you're really faint. I don't know. Is there something that you haven't plugged in or something? I can hardly hear you. Um, hold on. I think you're... Um, is this better? Yes, way better. Okay. okay. <laughs> this microphone sucks. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, just to reintroduce myself so with clear volume. Yeah, my name's Alex. I currently work as an Android tech lead at Instagram. Um, also wanted to thank Rahul for giving me the opportunity to participate in this panel today with so many other great engineers. Um, how I got into Android is um, it's kind of like a hobby. Uh, this was back in 2013 when I was still a student at UCLA. It was just a way for me to uh, pass the time. Um, when I was uh, during the summer, I had an internship, and then after work, I, did, I had some free time. So I, I used that time to bring some of my dumb ideas to life and build some apps that I ended up publishing to the Play Store and then playing around with on my own phone. Um, after I graduated, I went to work for PayPal. Um, uh, even though it was 2014, PayPal wasn't uh, completely on mobile yet. So the op mobile opportunities there were, were not super plentiful. So I ended up doing a lot of like kind of Java backend work. So I wasn't really happy there because I wanted to do Android and it just felt like the most fun and accessible thing. I think the magic of seeing something on, you know, on the device that you always have on you in the palm of your hand is really, really cool and has a huge pull in why I do Android now. <clears throat> so I ended up building, like, I continued building apps for fun, um, like, after work. And uh, after a year at PayPal, I ended up going to a startup called Course Hero in Redwood City. It's not like Coursera, but it's different. It's two separate words. Um, course and then Hero, like Batman. Um, and... They wanted someone with like three years of Android experience because they needed to build an Android app, uh, but they didn't have any engin Android engineers there. Um, but I was able to show them the apps I built and they uh, luckily like took a chance on me. So I was able to go there and build their Android app from scratch, which I think has over uh, half a million downloads at this point. Um, so I was there for two years. Um, but I wanted to work on like harder Android problems and at greater scale. So after two years at Course Hero, I went to work for Facebook, um, where I met Rahul, and we had an awesome time together working on Portal, uh, the video, video conferencing device for a year. Um, I was working on the voice assistant side. And then after one year at Portal, I went to Instagram, working on the ad side, which is where I've been for the last two years. Right. And then I think the other perspective that Alex, have, Alex has, which is really valuable, which again, Alex failed to mention, but I think it's super impressive, is that he, how many, you have two or three apps and each of them, they're totally indie, totally owned by Alex, all the code written by Alex, and they each have maybe like 500K or a million downloads, something like that, right? Yeah, I have two apps that are like around 500K downloads, and I've published a bunch of apps, because like whenever I have any idea, I'll just build it out. So I've probably published like 25 apps over the past seven years, and there are like five or six of them that have gotten like over 100,000 downloads apiece. Yeah, so I think having that ability to just I think Alex is honestly one of the fastest coders I've, I've met. So that ability to take an idea and turn it very quickly into an Android app and use libraries and use tools um, is something that Alex can speak to a lot. So that was super helpful. Thank you. Um, what I heard from a bunch of you is that you had kind of a meandering path into the world of Android. So one question I get a lot from students is around why Android, right? And so it sounds like some of you kind of fell into Android Whereas maybe for others, it might have been a conscious decision to do Android development versus iOS versus web. And so I'm wondering if you could talk about that. And maybe a particular question is like, if you could start over again and assume you had no background in Android or any kind of programming, would you still pick Android? I don't know. You don't have to go in order. But if you have opinions or strong thoughts on this, then feel free to chime in. 
Okay, I guess I can start. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, to answer the question, uh, like why I'm doing Android, um, I think what I love the most about Android is the accessibility. Like the entire operating system is open source and that kind of like culture and spirit kind of bleeds to the rest of the process. Um, it's really easy getting an Android app uh, up and running. Um, and for context, I've actually done both iOS and Android development, and it's quite diff it's quite a lot harder <laughs> uh, getting like iOS stuff up and running, and it's even harder getting it published. Though I understand Apple has lowered the barriers over time, but like just to add context, you know, you only need a twenty-five dollar uh, one-time fee to publish apps to the Google Play Store. Um, I think that's pretty trivial for everyone here. Um, and even though Google has ramped up the review process over like the past few years, it's still like incredibly fast. Um, like, like back when I was developing apps in 2013, like the review process was crazy short. Like the, the launch of the app would maybe take a day to go through and every subsequent update would take like 30 minutes to like three hours. Like most of the time it was like within an hour, like your update starts, starts going out to people. And um, the library like arsenal is really helpful as well. And I think that's like part of like the openness, like like Jake is actually a big reason why I'm doing Android development because his, his libraries are are amazing and I use them in pretty much like all my apps. Um, and to answer your second question of like if I were to like start over, like would I fall into Android? I'm pretty confident I would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Anyone else? Yeah, I can go ahead and go. Um, I chose Android mainly because I fell into the, the situation. Um, it was one of those... Uh, types of scenarios that you'll see as you get into the software and software development ca your career as a software developer that history repeats itself just a new technology comes out there everything's kind of a blank canvas new patterns and practices will start being uh, adopted that were adopted 10 20 years ago in different languages and you'll you'll see these these cycles happen and when i fell into android it was uh, a brand new technology uh, at, you know mobile phones were with apps were basically brand new at that point. And the thought of actually building something and getting it in front of millions of people was a, a very enticing thought. Um, and to be honest, I wasn't a huge fan of Java, um, but it was the tool that I needed to use to build the applications. And um, since I had an Android phone, I just decided to start doing it. Um, and the big aha moment came for me when I put a couple of apps out, they were just kind of just a couple of soundboard based applications just for playing around. Uh, and within a few days, you know, that I had, you know, 100,000 installs. And over a couple of months, I had over five or 6 million installs from just some random silly apps that I had. And it was an amazing feeling to know that these things were being used by folks. Um, and then the reason why I stayed in it, to be honest, is um, a lot of folks were looking for Android developers, which a few others have mentioned here, that you, no one could find developers back then that did Android. And they were very, very difficult to, to get a hold of. Um, and so I jobs were just naturally shoved at me. And at the time, the rates being an independent consultant, you could set your rate and people were willing to pay it. Um, so it was a very lucrative uh, career to move into. Um, and this is the case with any new technology that's popular, not many people know it. So if it's in high demand, your rates can go up, et cetera. Uh, the second question, would I continue, uh, would I start from there today if that was the case? Um, I don't know, uh, it's hard to say. I prefer to go with kind of what interests me. So if that's going to be a web technology, I might go there. If it's going to be, uh, if it's going to be mobile, I might go there. Uh, it really depends for me. It's all about the interest uh, and, and happiness at the end of the day. And of course, is it's going to be something that they can pay the bills as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Shasha or Jake, do you want to comment in or we can go on to the next question? Uh, Pretty much I don't know what you, with everything. <laughs> Go ahead, Jake. Yeah. Um, I don't like I don't know what year uh, you all are in. For me, Android was announced I think my junior year of college. Uh, and the prospect of being able to develop for an operating system for free with a one time twenty five dollar fee, which was mentioned, and that was the entire barrier of entry compared to iOS or the iPhone, uh, which is what I had in my pocket at the time, which was a $99 per year developer fee, and you had to have a MacBook. And so, you know, I had like a $600 Linux laptop 
Uh, and while I had an iPhone, it, it was basically impossible for me to build apps for that. And so instead, I chose the platform that was free to develop for on the laptop that I already owned. That was $25 to publish, to like get entry to the, the Android market. And being as cheap as I was, being in college at the time, my first app cost a dollar. And as soon as I see two versions or whatever, which after like Google's 30% equated to $25, I made it free. So like I got my money back uh, and then I made it free. And I didn't have an Android, I think, entirely on my laptop and on the emulator. Uh, and that's just like a level of accessibility to be able to create something that other than maybe the web is pretty unparalleled. Uh, and at the time, you know, the web was already an established thing. And so this, this was like a dramatically emerging market, uh, mobile phones at the time. Uh, and to some degree, it still is, you know, like the next billion uh, initiative from Google to get another billion people. And so there's, there's still like this massive land grab that's happening. And even though there's these massive players, there's still a ton of room uh, for, for, for products and uh, brand new apps to come in and fill that space. And so there's so much to dislike about Android and there's so much I like about other platforms. But if I had to choose again, I, I had to choose today, I think I still would choose, would choose Android. Yeah, I feel like that idea that we've heard, I think each person said that ethos of Android being open and free compared to other platforms like iOS, which are much more kind of exclusive, that really rings true for a bunch of Android developers, which, which I think we're all hearing. Okay, so next question I had, maybe I think Shasha in particular, I would like to hear your opinion on this, is how do you handle the rate of change in Android? So with the world of Android, you have brand new libraries that are introduced every year you have kind of a recommended architecture for how to design your app, and that might change over time. And sometimes you even have a brand new language to do Android development. So I'm wondering, Shasha, from the perspective of someone who leads a team of dozens of Android engineers, how do you think about introducing these new technologies into your code base? And also for the folks who are maybe building a library or you're consulting on a project, how do you decide how much to be on the cutting edge versus using Android technology, which is tried and true? Yeah, um, I, I, I don't know, maybe you got a taste of this when we work together. I think um, I'm frustratingly conservative, I think, technology wise with, um, uh, you know, like, I, I think that, um, you know, uh, the Pinterest Android app, a lot of people that you can reach and a lot of people that you can let down if you if you make the wrong decision or if you know, if you introduce something that makes your app really unstable. Um, I think the other thing to think about is, you know, you kind of mentioned like this is, we have somewhere around 40 people um, committing to the Android code base at Pinterest, um, which I guess compared to, you know, kind of Facebook scale is pretty small. But, um, you know, you, you have to think about sort of like, how do you make a consistent experience for somebody who might be jumping around from feature to feature um, or, you know, working on Android for a little bit, then going to back end, and then six months later coming back into Android. Um, so, you know, like, I think those are the, it, it's nothing unique to Android. Um, I think those are just sort of general kind of like software engineering challenges. Um, but, you, you know, like, I, I think that there's always this trade off between kind of doing like the hot new thing, um, and then just doing something that's like, that will work that we that we know um, is stable, and you know, that we know is not gonna is not gonna blow up. Um, so, you know, we, we have a process essentially for people to request, um, adding new, new libraries, um, into the Android app. Um, and it's, it's fairly heavy handed, I think kind of by design, because we really want to make sure that people are thinking about, um, you know, all the code that we introduce into our app. Um, you know, like if it's somebody's personal side project on GitHub, what happens if they d decide to delete it, you know? Uh, so, so I think these are like kind of all things that um, you, you need to, to keep in mind. Um, I, I think that Google has done a really good job in recent years at putting a lot of kind of their new stuff into uh, what used to be called support library, but you know, into, into Jetpack and so, so that, you know, even if you're on, um, older OS is like you should be able to take advantage of some of the, the newer um, libraries. So um, my, 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 uh, my perspective is, has always been, you know, like you're talking about 
um, app architecture, I think people are really, really opinionated about, you know, like MVP or MVVM or, you know, people are like, let's rewrite the app with unit unidirectional data flow. Um, and I think, you know, like if, if a bunch of, you know, kind of smart people whose opinions you trust are all arguing, then probably not one is, is clearly better than the other. So it, you just have to kind of like pick something and commit to it um, and just make sure that you see it through because uh, otherwise it's going to, you know, kind of leave your code base in a mess. Um, and so, you know, it's weird to think about, but like part of my job is thinking about like, you know, how do I make sure that in five or 10 or 15 years, like the Pinterest app is still running on Android. Um, and mm -hmm. so, you know, I think we start to have to think at that time scale, um, cause you know, obviously Android is not going away. It's only getting more popular. And so we have to think about kind of like longevity and stability, um, things like that. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is basically focusing on the long-term health of a code base leads you to maybe be a bit more conservative and you're not that eager to pick up all the brand new stuff that Google puts out. I, I think that's probably more personality, like it's my personality, you know, I, I think that there are arguments, if, if you can, you know, for example, like if you can get the entire Android team on board and, you know, all 40 people like rewrite the app within a month and then it's all on the new, you know, on the new library, then I think that's okay. Um, I think you get into trouble when you start to have kind of these forks in your app where like, you know, this code is six months, you know, it was written six months ago. So it was written one way. This code was written this week. And so it's using some new library. Um, I think that's when you start to get into trouble. Hmm. Makes sense. Anyone else on that? Yeah, I can go. Um, the, the rate of change in Android is um, at a, I'd say a blistering pace. <laughs> the uh, and this is with any software in general. Two weeks from now, there'll be something brand new released. Uh, back when I started in 2008, I learned from a, a code base that was actually the original Foursquare application code base, and I felt like I could kind of wrap my arms around the entire Android ecosystem a little bit, kind of like a bear hug it, and uh, like I kind of understand the most majority of it. Within a year or two, it just exploded uh, to the point where it was just impossible to manage. And now there's libraries and, and components in different parts of the SDK that I just have no clue how they work. Um, and I try not to concern myself about, all right, well, this, you know, this library or this component over here is for dealing with enterprise devices and locking it down. Do I need to learn that? No, I'm going to learn it when I need to learn it just in time. And so I try to approach it as a more of a, do I need this? Do I have this problem? Is it going to solve that problem? If so, let me go ahead and play with it. And usually I'll do that inside of some test application or side project to kind of understand the fundamentals of it. Um, and the, the thing that's different about uh, the way I develop uh, versus a lot of uh, developers, in my opinion, is that uh, from a consulting perspective, I'm hired to solve business problems. So I'll come in have to understand what the business problem is and then write the code to fix it for whatever that application is. And then my job, in my opinion, is to leave a code base that's maintainable for the developers that are coming behind me. Uh, I have shown up many times in code bases where they're just completely decimated by consultants that have just kind of gone in there and hacked everything together. I try to make sure that there's a clean path behind me. Now, what that does mean is I may not adopt the brand new library because it's mm -hmm. so fresh and so new and I'm not sure if it's gonna be what's considered a standard. So I'm, I'll usually be more conservative and reach into the toolbox and say, all right, well, here's the tools that have worked for me before. Maybe it's retrofit, maybe it's something else and you know all these other libraries and kind of build the application together in a well-known structure. If that's gonna be using something from Jetpack or if it's gonna be the MVP pattern, uh, it kind of depends on that, on that point in time. And furthermore, if the application is architected, maybe there's already an app there. If it's already architected in a given pattern uh, and my job is just to create a feature for that, I will follow that existing pattern. So there's not a huge, um, basically a huge context switch going on when people hop between files and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. That's coming from a, a consultant perspective. Now, if we are going to rewrite the application, then of course, then we'll make that decision on what files and features need to change and so forth. So that's how I deal with it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And you talked about libraries. I'm wondering, Jake, as someone who's a prolific open source contributor and maintainer of a bunch of libraries, is the way you approach adopting something like, I don't know, RxJava or a bunch of other 
I guess you can't really use RxJava inside of a library, but how do you think about library development and adopting these new patterns that come out? Um, yeah, I mean, at Square, historically, we've sort of treated adoption of new technologies as being inversely proportional to the seriousness of what it touches. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, smaller apps that have been built, like the, the product I work on, Cash App, at one time was extremely small. And so it served as a test bed for, you know, like the Kotlin language or uh, a new navigation framework or, you know, RxJava 2 or whatever. Uh, and, and as it becomes more and more serious, uh, which it is now very serious, um, we're a lot more conservative in, in what we choose. But that I don't necessarily think that means that you should stop being uh, you should stop being interested in potentially adopting new things. Um, it's just that you need to find the right place to to try them out, and usually that's not in the you know main uh, pathway that a user goes through your app. Uh, and so now, like we try things out on like setting screens, or we actually have a a screen that just lists the open source libraries that are in the app, and we we have like uh, you put like motion layout in there, which is a new like visual layout with fancy animations that you can use. And it serves as a test bed for this technology that we can try it out in an isolated location of the app. Whereas if we look back and say, well, you know, that was cool, but I don't think it's going to fit in with the rest of the app. It's very easy to tear it back out and try something else. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, yeah, it's just, uh, it, it becomes harder and harder as your team gets larger to echo uh, Shasha's point of, you don't want to be able to look at part of your code base and say like, oh, I can tell this was written in 2017 because they were using this pattern. Um, it, it's really hard to not fall into that trap though. And so it, it does require this like mindset uh, where you sort of have to clean up after yourself, your former self or you know your, your former teammates uh, code in order to establish sort of a, a, a baseline that exists across the whole app because then it's only going to make things easier and even enable you to experiment with these things faster if your code base is much more consistent. All right, thank you for that. Our first question from a student is, will the job market for Android developers continue to grow in the future? Um, I guess I can give an opinion here if anyone else wants to step up right now. Um, I'm actually quite optimistic about the future of Android. Um, I think Though admittedly, my perspective is a bit warped because I work at Facebook, um, which is very much an Android first company. Uh, and we're constantly short on Android headcount, like hiring Android engineers, like on my team and pretty much every other team within Facebook Inc. is quite difficult. Um, but I think Android is here to stay. Um, like a big part is the reasons that like me and all the other folks I mentioned before, it's quite open and very accessible. And I think that's a huge boon for both. It makes people want to develop on a platform. And then it also makes people want to like, you know, get Android devices, right? Because the possibilities are truly endless on Android. Um, like the ceiling is sky high because of how open it is. And just from like a numbers perspective, um, I mean, Android is like absolutely crushing it, like outside of, I think, United States and Japan. There are very few markets where like iOS is ahead or like a non-Android player is ahead. Um, and there, I don't see any threat to Android anytime soon there. Um, so yeah, I'm actually like quite enthusiastic about like the, the, the future of Android. I think the current user base is very large. I don't think it will shrink. I think it will continue to grow. And because of that, I think the job market will also continue to grow. And like, at least from like the present, like, like kind of the meta surrounding Android job availability is extremely good. I, I think it's also, um, it's important to remember that uh, actually like not a lot of the code that you're gonna be writing in an Android app, especially I think in, in a large code base, you know, say at the, the Square Facebook Pinterest uh, level, um, not a lot of that is like super, super Android specific. It's just, you know, it's code, it's just software engineering. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a, a lot of kind of anxiety amongst um, some of the more senior Android engineers about whether their 
you know, kind of boxing themselves in um, into, you know, saying, oh, like that's, you know, that's just the Android, the Android person and all they know how to do is Android. Um, but really, you know, you're, you're learning kind of good software engineering. Um, and the, the problems that, that, that I think about are, you know, there, a lot of them are not super, super Android specific. Um, it's just sort of, you know, again, sort of like, how do you, how do you write a code base that um, a lot of people can contribute to? How do you make it understandable? How do you make sure that it's, you know, well tested and it's not going to blow up? Um, and these are all things that are super transferable. Um, you know, and I say this, you know, I, like I, I, I always say I'm, I'm actually, I'm, I'm not the most, I'm, I'm not the best Android engineer at Pinterest. There are a lot of people who know way more about kind of the nitty gritty of Android than I do. Um, but I think the reason why I was put in this position, I, I think just sort of just general skill, I think around kind of like software engineering and architectural decisions um, and, and a lot less about sort of like knowing exactly all of the different, you know, APIs for text view or something. Thanks. And to uh, echo a lot of the similar thoughts that, that Alex said is that there's a ton of opportunity that's out there. I've had almost ev actually every single client that I've had in my career as an Android developer cannot find enough qualified Android engineers. Every single one of them is still looking for more Android engineers. And with Google's push, um, as Jake mentioned, into the, the next billion, it's just going to move even, even further. I have many friends throughout the entire world. Uh, and again, mentioned uh, earlier, the number of Android devices just dwarfs iOS. And in, in a lot of countries, it's just iOS is like not even, a, it's a non-starter. It's all Android. So I think the future is very bright and I think there's a ton of opportunity uh, and I wouldn't dismiss it at all. In, in case students aren't familiar, Don, do you mind explaining what, what do you mean when you say next billion? Um, I'm going to defer that question to Jake because he probably has more information on that given his background with Google. So I'm going to defer that one to him. Yeah, it's basically, uh, I don't even remember when the time frame was, but uh, Google had announced that there were, but now they tend to talk in terms of like devices. So there's like two and a half billion Android devices used monthly, uh, which is insane. It's the most successful operating system in the history of the world. Uh, so the opportunity there is, is great. But in that 2.5 billion devices, say there's only like 1.2 billion people using those, or 1.5. Um, you know, there's still 6 billion people-ish that aren't using Android. So, you know, throw a billion to iOS. There's, there's, there's billions of people that still are, are not connected uh, through anything, and phones tend to be an extremely low-cost way to get connected to the internet. And so the next billion initiative is basically just driving down phones so that people that aren't connected can become connected and increasing coverage of internet access through tons of different initiatives. You may have heard of like some of the insane projects that Google and Facebook do with like blimps and planes and satellites to just get internet to these places that don't have internet so that you can get, um, you know, another billion people connected to the internet. And it's likely because of the cost factor and, you know, the operating system being free that they're going to be connected through Android. Uh, and so that the next billion is basically just this marketing term around um, lower cost devices, getting it to people that aren't yet connected to the internet and broadly expanding internet coverage worldwide to places that historically haven't had it. The next question from a student is, what drew you to software development? And would each of you consider yourselves software developers? I can, uh, I'll take that one first. I have a background um, prior to software of just general tinkering, building uh, from woodworking projects to tearing apart engines. And, and prior to being uh, in software, um, I was a motorcycle mechanic and a, and a cabinet maker. That was my profession. And I fell into software um, kind of just by chance when, when I found the internet and decided to try to make a web page. And then I had that same uh, internal feeling of 
creating something from nothing. And I've always enjoyed that. I've always enjoyed the process of creating and, and having that ability to do that on mobile phones or the web or whatever, uh, and just kind of create something of value has just always uh, attracted me to the field of software development. Um, yeah, I guess I'll go. Um, I, uh, the, the real honest answer is that I started in computer science um, so that my parents would stop asking me to go to medical school. <laughs> Um, and uh, it, it seemed, you know, I, I, I think I only kind of vaguely understood what, what computer science was and what programming was um, towards, you know, around the time when I was thinking about where to go to school. Um, but it, it seemed like a reasonable thing to do. And, 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 and actually what I, I wanted to get into um, visual effects uh, and computer animation. Um, it, it turns out you, you need a lot stronger math skills than I had. Um, so I kind of, um, I went to an adjacent field, which is game development, which um, I had, you know, had, I am still a lifelong gamer. Um, and so it would sort of never occur to me that uh, kind of like um, one of the other panels was saying never occurred to you that you could have a full-time job making Android. It never occurred to me you have a full-time job making games. Um, and so for me, it was very, very games focused for a long time. I, I sort of thought that's what I liked about software development was making games and, you know, seeing at the end, you know, you can look at the credits and see my name there. And that, that's pretty cool. Um, but, you know, when I kind of talked about my, my journey to where I am today, then, you know, the trend was that I was getting farther and farther from kind of pure game development um, with each job transition. And, and then I realized actually, hey, you know, what, what I liked was not, it's not, it's, um, it's not necessarily sort of like building a game on the other end, but it's like all of the problems that I get to solve along the way and the people that I get to work with. Um, so for me, you know, it was kind of like a, a late realization um, and, and even late in my career where I realized sort of like, you know, what about sort of fundamentally computer science that I, that I loved. Um, I had a kind of adjacent question. I think Don and Chacha, you both provided a lot of wisdom around how did, how did you think about the field of software development? I'm curious about how do you think about the type of company or environment that you work in? So Shasha, you talked about how you transitioned from game development to kind of a pure kind of Android play at Pinterest. And Don, you have an extensive background in consulting. So I'm one, I think for Stanford students, the majority of students, I would say, either go on to do a startup, um, join a big company, um, or, you know, maybe they'll, they'll go into like consulting or banking. And so how much, how, how do you think about the different options of like consulting or freelancing or big company um, in, in your career path? I'll go first. Um, I have a, my career has been the majority consulting. I have had um, a number of years where I was a full-time employee. Um, probably a, th a quarter of my career has been full-time employee, and that's the first quarter. Uh, and then what I found for me, and this is a personality thing, is that I would eventually get bored uh, with what I was working on. And uh, it could be bored with the market, could be bored with the app, could be bored with a number of things. And I accidentally found a job as a consultant, not really knowing what that was at the time and got shuffled around to different clients for anywhere from two months to six months to a year. And then I'd get shoved over to another client. And what I found for myself is that I really loved that. It was just, I got to see new people. I got to meet new teams. I got to experience different market verticals, uh, different problems from real estate to finance, to fitness, to, you know, uh, e-commerce, whatever you name it, I've, I've kind of done it. And to me, that's always been very interesting. Um, because I can kind of just try a bunch of different things. Um, now, at every company I have been to, they have also offered me a job. They want me to stay there full time. And it's kind of one of those things of you have to have a particular personality and mindset for consulting because it is a feast or famine type of, of environment, meaning that when the going is good, it's good. Uh, you're getting a lot of clients, you can bill real high, 
And then when the going gets rough, maybe you hit a recession, maybe there's something going on. Uh, maybe you lose your, your job in the middle of a, of a pandemic and no one's hiring. Um, it's rough. So you have to plan for these things, you know, you, you know, financially. Uh, and that's a different, you, it's a different mindset than having, knowing that you're going to be just, you wake up, you go into work, uh, you have eight hours. Uh, furthermore, when you are consulting, you bill per hour. And it's a very hamster wheel approach, meaning that if I don't bill today, if I don't work any hours for my client today, I don't get paid today. I don't have days off. I don't, you know, I have to build all those in to my, to my income, to my hourly state, to my hourly rate, including insurance, which is kind of the big thing of like, how do you pay for insurance? So um, you have to think about all those things. And it's basically, it comes down to risk tolerance for me. Uh, and I've become very, I've understood how to handle that. Um, and I also like the freedom that consulting provides. Uh, however, every once in a while, I do think about how nice it would be to be able to go to a full-time job and not have to worry about a lot of the consulting stuff that I do worry about on a day-to-day -day basis. I guess I can give my perspective here on the different yeah. like career paths as well. Um, so I've worked for three different companies over the past six years. Um, I worked for two big companies, uh, PayPal and Facebook, um, but they're quite different. And then I also worked for a startup, um, quite a small startup, more like we were very much still just like trying to get a product out the door. We had to get the Android app out the door. Um, <clears throat> like the insights I can share here is uh, when it comes to growth, uh, big companies and startups in particular will teach you vastly different things. Um, in the end, you can learn any skill anywhere, but I think like startups will lean towards a certain skill set and then bigger companies will lean towards a different skill set. Um, in particular, I think startups are great if you just want to like learn how to build something. Um, it's very commonly described as zero to one work. So like your goal is just to get something out the door and then make sure it doesn't catch on fire and then make sure your servers stay up. Um, so there's definitely like a lot of things to learn there. And it's definitely like a very high paced, alluring environment. Um, it's definitely quite fun. Um, but with a lot of startups, unfortunately, you will hit a wall. Um, because like after you get something out the door, uh, it becomes unclear what to do next. So generally what I've seen with products, and this is from working at Coursera and from building my own apps is in the beginning, when you have when you build something, it's very clear what to do next. You'll see like a huge portion of users demanding this certain feature. And then you and then intuitively it makes sense. You're like, okay, yeah, why doesn't this app have X? Like this is the most natural extension of how I should evolve that. And you build it. And you and you do that again and again and again until you reach like hundred K users or a million users. Um, and, but then you hit that point where there is no like dominantly obvious feature for you to build and and the user base becomes a lot more segmented in terms of feedback. And that point you need a different skill set. You have to learn how to refine something. And this is where all like the A-B testing comes into play. Facebook is famous for like constantly running experiments on the Facebook app, Instagram app, et cetera. Um, and re it requires a, a much different skill set because you're not going zero to one anymore. You're going from like one to like 1.1 or like 1.2. Um, and it becomes a lot slower, um, but it's not because you're doing less, it's because you're doing something different. Um, and like, as the app gets bigger, the team around you also gets bigger. So like what I've noticed is like when I'm working at a bigger company, the soft skills are much more important. Um, at a startup, everyone's just kind of heads down trying to get something out the door so you survive and then you can like you know, unlock the next round of funding. But like at a big company like Facebook, like being alive, like we've mastered being alive there's really no fear of the company going belly up anytime soon. And as I said, there's like no super obvious low hanging fruit features for us to build. So now it becomes like, you know, there's a huge direction problem of like, where do we go? And when you're working there, you, you have now have the problem of like, you need to present a vision out of like 20 different visions across your org of like where the product needs to go. And then you have to win people over. Um, and that's like a completely different set of skills. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then Jake, I'm also wondering if you we could get your perspective because then you've built libraries that are literally used in hundreds of thousands of apps. So I'm wondering, how do you think about, like I'm, I, th I imagine a large part of your day is around con contributions to open source. How do you think about doing that within the context of a larger company versus, I don't know, doing it on your own somehow? Yeah, I mean, uh, 
the success that we have had, and I, I say we because oftentimes I get attributed for a lot of these things with, it really is a lot of people that contribute to these. Um, the, success, like, the success of the libraries has come from uh, a, a cultural mindset that like we're going to be writing this code anyway. So why not make it open source rather than closed source? Because it's not, it's not, um, there's no like business value to an HTTP client. Uh, I'm not giving away a competitive advantage to do that. And so, um, you know, you, it, when, when companies get large enough, they tend to have these problems where they create people that just work on like infrastructure parts of the app, which is like the foundation on which the app is built so that other engineers working on features uh, are able to do their jobs more effectively. And, and that's sort of where I've always lived and where these libraries have come out of. Um, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's really at all related to the size of the company you work for, whether you're an individual or working at a Facebook or a Google. Um, that just comes down to mindset. I mean, it's it's really not that much extra work to put something into the open. Uh, there is an, a long-term cost to maintaining those things that are in the open, uh, but there's also long-term rewards to be had. And unfortunately, in terms of like the people who uh, tell you what to do, it's really hard to quantify those rewards and say, you know, like we've hired this many people because we did open source or our engineering brand has, you know, grown to be so much more reputable. It's like these impossible things to measure. Uh, and so you really just have to have a mindset that it's something you want to do. And it doesn't matter if you're an individual. I mean, I got started as an individual. Uh, I, I started open sourcing libraries because I used someone else's open source library. And so it was like a pay it forward kind of thing. And when I got to Square, it was the same thing. It's the, the engine, the, um, the CTO at the time just essentially beat into us this idea that, you know, we're benefiting so much from the work of others that it's almost irresponsible to not contribute back where we can. Uh, and I think it's, you know, I, at first I was extremely skeptical, skeptical of that approach. Um, but over the time, you know, having been at Square so long, uh, it's really paid, paid dividends in terms of like being able to hire people and the success of our app. Uh, and seeing contributions come in from other people that's like free performance wins. You know, somebody contributes a performance optimization now to a retrofit or an OKHDP. OK it's like every single, not every single app, but you know, a non-trivial subset of every single app in the Android ecosystem gets that performance win, not just you. And that could be, again, an individual or a big company like Facebook contributing that. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm not exactly answering the question directly, but like, uh, I don't think it has anything to do with whether you're an individual, whether you're a startup or whether you're at a massive company. It just comes down to like this mindset um, that you have to have. And uh, unfortunately, it can become really hard to convince people to do these things just because of that nature of not being able to quantify the payoff. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of impact that I think you've proven out at Square, um, you know, by doing open source. So. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, one more student question here. How closely do you work with iOS developers? And how do you ensure design or feature parity between the Android and iOS app at the company you work for? Yeah, I can chime in here. Um, this is a big problem at Facebook, obviously, because we're also on iOS. And then both apps, apps are like very complex and used by a ton of people. Um, I think the, the first step towards having Android and iOS stay in sync and not, not just Android and iOS, just teams across the company in general is to have a very strong and open culture. And that's one of the core values at Facebook, one of the five core values that like could literally be open. <clears throat> so like Facebook definitely has an environment where people are pretty much like always talking and always sharing. And then for those of you who don't know, we actually use uh, Facebook internally to communicate and manage our work. Um, like Facebook for Enterprise, it's called Workplace. So people are constantly like sharing what they're doing in a very public setting. And another thing that we do is the, the organizational structure. Um, so generally what happens is um, when an org is very small, um, Android and iOS are split up into specific teams. 
Um, so like back in uh, from 2012, all the way up until 2016, because Instagram took a very kind of like slow growth approach. Um, like there's no need to just rapidly explode your team because then onboarding becomes a problem. Um, so for, during those like four or five years, there was an Android iOS team. But then once it got to the point <laughs> where um, we had more than 10 engineers each on both platforms. We split up uh, by features. So I, I work in ads on the Instagram side. Um, we, we're, we're not split up by platform. We're split up by like, you know, the features in the app we work on. In this case, it's ads features. So how the teams are structured is it's essentially like feature pods. So like this team will own like a specific space of the app and like the features that go within it. And then the team will have, you know, one iOS engineer, one Android engineer, um, you know, one person working on the website, PM, et cetera. So like whenever you contribute a feature to the app, um, like since the team has like, you know, it's not split up by stack, has like one of every person, it's, it looks and feels consistently across all the surfaces. And we also try to stay in sync through mechanisms such as tech review so that even the architecture is like, you know, the high level architecture is similar across different platforms um, because like Facebook is very, open and flexible company when it comes to team switching. So we want to make sure that there's these fundamental engineering values that bleed across the entire company. So if you like switch in between stacks, like you don't have to like completely shift your engineering worldview. Anyone else? I mean, maybe Shasha, do you want to talk about, cause I know there was this big re-architecture that happened at Pinterest while I was there and Shasha was part of called Brio. Uh, do you want to talk about what were the goals of that redesign? Um, sure. So, I mean, uh, Pinterest has, you know, essentially the same structure um, that Alex is describing that Facebook and Instagram have, which is, you know, we have um, feature teams that are divided, uh, that are sort of staffed full stack. Um, and, uh, you know, so each of those teams has sort of like a back end and then all three clients. Um, and so in that way, I guess to answer the question directly, you know, very similarly, um, that's sort of, you know, we have one designer who is serving all three um, clients uh, for the same feature. And so that's sort of how we try to ensure that that kind of consistency. Um, Brio was is sort of the internal code name of, of a very, very large like visual redesign that the entire uh, product went through. Um, so it was web, um, iOS, uh, and Android. Um, on, on Android, it was, it was mostly a, a, a visual redesign. Um, iOS uh, actually took that opportunity to stop feature development and re-architect the entire app, um, as well as kind of do the, um, do the visual refresh. Um, and then web kind of did a similar thing a little bit later. Um, and so, you know, like, I, I think um, it's good because obviously, you know, for companies like Facebook and um, Pinterest, you know, there's a, a very strong kind of brand and design language and you want that kind of consistency between, um, between uh, platforms. Uh, I think another thing to think about, though, is that you may not actually want things to be exactly the same across platforms. Um, so, you know, it's like you don't want I think, you know, you've kind of failed if somebody, um, you know, if, if you start up your Android app and it just looks like an iOS app running on an Android device, um, because, you know, I think they're, they're actually converging now a little bit more strongly, but, you know, there, there are uh, kind of different norms um, on uh, different norms, different best practices, different kind of visual languages across the platforms. And so you you want it to feel like a native app. You know, you want it to feel like this app was built for Android or this app was built for iOS. Um, and so, you know, it, it's actually uh, Pinterest, like most Silicon Valley companies, maybe not Facebook, I guess, because they're Android first, um, but they're extremely iOS focused. Um, and I think that's more of just sort of a, a, a result of kind of the devices that, you know, the design team mostly has are iOS devices. And so part of, you know, if, if you all go into Android, um, and I think it's the same with web, part of your job as an Android engineer is, is to sort of fight for your platform and is to make under, you know, make designers who may not be as familiar with your platform um, aware of those be best practices and those norms and, you know, sort of like help convince them why <clears throat> making an iOS clone that runs on 
an Android device is not going to be the, the best experience for your users. In my experience, it's been, um, depends on the, the company and at what phase I'm, you know, I might be coming in or, or joining a team. And sometimes, uh, actually a lot of the times I'm brought in to help build out the Android app if there is not one yet. And so if the app is fairly large inside of a fairly iOS app is fairly large and we want to reach feature parity, uh, we have to kind of think about the, the budget that the, the company has as well as like, all right, well, what features can we develop within that budget to kind of get you what you need? And then we'll kind of iterate from there. So that's kind of, that happens a lot with startups who are, you know, just trying to get the, the app up and going with larger companies. Um, what I found is very similar uh, to what Alex and Sasha have said is that there's maybe a common design language that's used. And what I mean by that is that all buttons are going to be blue with a rounded corner of two pixels or whatever. And all the screens are going to be similar, except for Android, we may have, you know, we'll utilize the back button instead of the, you know, the arrow or something like that. And usually what I've found in these situations is again, very similar. There's feature teams. So there's Android engineers and iOS engineers working on the same features at the same time. And a lot of the times we'll communicate over whatever medium that is, if it's Slack or whatever, and say, hey, how are you doing this? Or how are you running this problem? What's the API you're hitting? And just to make sure everything uh, is in sync when the app and the new feature launches. Cool, one more student question. What advice do you have for a new grad to become a tech lead or a decision maker on the team? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think uh, the, the advice that I, I like to give um, to uh, all new Android engineers at Pinterest um, is that you have about six or nine months before you get used to all of the stupid things that we do in our code. Um, and what I mean by that is that um, I actually, I really like seeing people see our code for the first time um, because I think, you know, uh, just coming in with a really fresh perspective, I think lets you look at things really objectively and, and ask yourself like, is this actually the best way to do things versus like, this is just the way that we do things. Um, and so, you know, I kind of alluded to um, when I started at Pinterest, um, I was actually a product engineer, but, um, uh, there were just there were just a few things that about building Pinterest uh, building Android at Pinterest that I that kind of bothered me. Um, you know, they were sometimes like process things. There was, you know, like linting, um, and 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 I thought, well, you know, if this if this thing is bothering me, it's probably bothering the other thirty people who are also committing code to the Android code base. Um, so uh, I was very fortunate I had a manager who gave me a little bit of freedom to kind of work on these things that I thought, you know, could be better. Um, and so, you know, I, I like I said, I, I just sort of started fixing things and changing things. And like I said, they started out very small um, and then they got bigger. Like I kind of re-architected our whole analytics system. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so I think in that sense, I, I sort of, um, I guess just sort of like got a, a bit of a reputation maybe of just someone who had kind of maybe reasonable technical <laughs> skills. Um, and uh, and I guess maybe a little bit is sort of like doing it in a way that, that doesn't, you know, get in the way of, 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 of other engineers. Um, and so, you know, like I, I think it was just sort of, you know, I said before, like, I don't think I'm, the best Android engineer at Pinterest, but um, I think it was just sort of like the set of skills that I had and the need that they had, which is that they, they needed some, they needed sort of like a, 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 at the size we are, a single person to be kind of the decision maker for some of these larger technical decisions in the app. Um, they also needed a single person to be accountable for those decisions. Um, and so I think, you know, I was just kind of there at the right place at the right time um, nobody hated me. Um, and, and so, you know, that's, that's kind of like how, how I got to, to where I was. And, you know, like I said, it, it started out just very small, um, and it was kind of organic. Um, and so, like I said, it was, you, I, I think, 
you know, look, look for the things that you can fix, you know, fight for the things that you believe in. Um, and, you know, like I said, I think I was very lucky to have managers that gave me the space um, that recognized what I was doing and rewarded me for it. I know that's not always the case. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a good place to start. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. Like what I'm hearing is the way to become a tech lead is to act like a tech lead, right? It's like basically do the work and prove value to the company, to your teammates, and the title will be trailing. Like you'll get that title eventually if you're doing that work. I think that's really good advice. Anyone else on that topic? I think everyone here is probably in some meaningful way architecting or tech leading uh, an app. Does anyone else have thoughts on that? Um, I can chime in here. Yeah, um, definitely echo a lot of the points that Shasha brought up. Um, I think the, the the core thing about being a tech lead, and this is something that you can start improving on um, as a new grad or just as being a person, is you want to be as selfless and open as possible. So like one thing I really liked about what Shasha said is that she really values the opinions of new people, right? Because like new folks, they don't, they don't, they haven't really like kind of settled into a groove or, or, or like kind of just but just put up with things and just kind of ignore stuff. Um, like any frustration like they get from the bad code is like going to be fresh. It's going to happen. And it, it, oftentimes like feedback from new folks is going to be very valuable in like improving your culture and your code base. Um, so like in terms of like how you can improve as even a new grad is just work on stuff, not solo, like find other people to build stuff with and then figure out how to collaborate in as healthy a way as possible. And where the selflessness comes in is like, you want to always make sure that you're listening. Like you don't always want to be trying to push like your own goal. Like your goal should just be to find the best decision. And given just, I mean, I feel like the vast majority of people who work in software are very hardworking and very intelligent. Getting the best decision oftentimes is just aggregating all the opinions around you and then kind of like distilling it into like a concrete action plan. So like one of the things I'm constantly doing as a tech lead is like, I'm not trying to push for certain decision to happen. I'm just trying to listen to as many like perspectives and feedbacks as possible. And then, you know, oftentimes I'll learn a lot in that process. And then from there, I'm just kind of, kind of, kind of fostering and pushing the conversation along. It's usually like not me, like pulling some final call out of nowhere. Like eventually the group kind of like converges towards an option that everyone likes. Um, I think your role as the tech lead is kind of, foster that discussion and make sure everyone's being respected and then everyone is heard. Um, the second piece of advice I have for like, how do you transition into a tech lead? I'm kind of like mirroring the same like thoughts as before is like, it should feel very natural. Like um, I don't really believe in um, like kind of gaming, trying to game your career growth and like actively fishing for a title. I don't think that's a healthy way of going about it. Um, you should be just leading by example. So like from my personal experience, um, I wasn't really trying to be a lead. I just like, I just want to come in and build a good product and like write good code and then build a, a great team that like works well together and where everyone feels like respected and like welcome all the time. So I just like try to write as much code as possible. I try to keep the quality bar uh, really, really high. Um, I had like very thorough like diff summaries and test plans because I empathize with the people who review my diffs. I want to make it as easy to review my diffs as possible. And I kind of, brought that when I was reviewing diffs as well, like try to keep the bar high and then always try to like foster discussion so we can always reach the best decision. And then just from like the sheer volume, like people eventually started, I like, kind of built an identity naturally. People are like, oh, Alex is always reviewing these diffs or putting out these diffs and like following these exact patterns. And he's like very convicted of like why he's doing it this way and like why it's best for the team. Um, so I actually, and, and at Facebook, there's actually no formal titles. Like everyone's just an engineer. <laughs> so the only reason I like refer to myself as tech lead now, is people just started referring to me as a lead. Like it wasn't like granted to me or anything. People just started like, ask, like, like Alex, you're an Android lead. Like, what do you think? And I was like, cool, I guess I'm a lead now. So that's how it ended up happening for me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I had one tactical question. We talked earlier about how, in general, I think all four of you are optimistic about the future of Android, which is a good sign. How do you think about cross-platform technologies which turn into Android apps, in particular, React Native and Flutter? And Flutter, in particular, is interesting because it's actually Google has a hand in Flutter. So what do you think about uh, those platforms and their growth and the viability of learning that instead of Android or maybe along with Android? 
Anyone have thoughts on that? Go ahead and go. I kind of have a controversial opinion on it. It's um, my take is um, if the application is in the game, it's nothing that requires very deep platform integration. So you don't need exact platform features. Um, maybe it's just forms over data. So kind of just a simple app. Um, I'll use a cross-platform technology. And right now I'm leaning towards Flutter. Um, and so for the apps that I develop for a lot of my clients, I'd probably say that 80% of them can probably be developed in Flutter if it's a greenfield application. If it's not a greenfield application, then I'm just going to resort strictly back to native. So back to default Android or iOS or whatever. I've tried the whole brownfield, which is where you kind of integrate some existing um, React Native into an existing Android app, and that just turned out to be a complete mess. So um, that's kind of my stance on it. Are you optimistic about the future? Like, would you encourage a Stanford student right now to you know, invest some time in Flutter? Or do you think it kind of just depends on the context? I think it depends on the context. I mean, if it interests you, take a look at it. I mean, uh, explore it if it interests you. Um, it is a product by Google. Um, Google is notorious for killing products. I know Jake's really excited about inbox dying. So, <laughs> um, so they are notorious for killing products, which is actually a very big concern of mine. So that's one big apprehension I do have. Mm -hmm. Jake, do you want to chime yeah, in? I would, I, would, I would love to chime in. <laughs> um, yeah, I have, I have a lot of opinions here. Uh, I think that React Native is very ambitious. Uh, I don't think it's completely succeeded on a technical level, but it started from a, it started with a premise that I think uh, was very pure in wanting to like honor each platform that it runs on. Um, but like the technical choices that they implemented have often, uh, that they, the technical choices that they made to create the product have often produced uh, like an underperformant um, result, although it's now like a um, becoming a potential desktop framework, which hopefully will get rid of like some Electron apps. Um, in terms of Flutter, uh, I think Flutter is like the manifestation of the abject failure of Google to harmonize the two most popular operating systems in the world which are Android and, and Chrome. Uh, you know, Chrome isn't the web, but Chrome sort of is a, a huge part of the web. Uh, and so they, they control these two platforms that sit essentially what's, what seems like diametrically opposed to each other, where there's this like chasm between them where you're either a, a web app or you're a native app. Uh, and so there's all kinds of advantages to you developing for the web. You know, you're immediately cross-platform. Uh, like fridges have web browsers, like everything has a web browser. And so by building a web app, your, your app becomes available everywhere. But there's all kinds of, historically, there's been all kinds of downsides, which is, you know, usually the language uh, and then the integration with sort of the native hardware hasn't been there. You can talk to Bluetooth, you can use video, you can um, do, use like OpenGL. And then you have native, which on the other side, which is, um, the stronger languages, uh, you know, it's like faster apps, apps that are quote unquote native. Uh, and instead of Google trying to blur the lines between these two operate, you know, they're essentially individual operating systems like Android native apps and the web, instead of trying to pull them closer together, um, they, they just have failed to do that. And so Flutter has come from, from Google of all places. Uh, it, it's like so horrible that it came from Google because they also own Android and Chrome. Uh, and it's sort of like between this chasm of Android and the web, uh, and they've created the, the development experience that everyone loves of the web, fast turnaround times, um, using reactive technologies to build your UI. It, it's a truly remarkable development experience. And then they've taken aspects of native, which is you know like ahead of time compiling to, to native code. Um, but I think it's, I, I just think it's the worst piece of technology in terms of like where I want the future. It's really, really impressive what they've done. I just hate it so much because it represents such a failure of Google. And the fact that it's Google that came out, uh, you know, there's no like broad 
uh, strategy at Google, like you know, Chrome and Android are, are together, but really separate. And, and Flutter is completely separate. It's these independent teams just doing things on their own. The same reason you have you know, 12 chat apps that have come out of Google and the same reason Inbox existed, which Don mentioned. It's just like, there's no harmony and unification there. And, and Flutter is like the realist manifestation of that. And so um, I think it's gonna serve as a catalyst for hopefully, I, obviously it served as a catalyst. I don't know if you guys have covered or seen Jetpack Compose. It's really lit a fire under the asses of the Android team in terms of modernizing how Android native Android apps are built. Uh, and so that's all gonna change hopefully for the better in the next two years. Uh, and I also really hope that it, it forces Android and Chrome to sort of harmonize a bit and blur the lines between what a web app is and what a native app is because there's no technical difference between the two. Uh, and so I'm like really, really, I, I just really hate Flutter, not because it's not an interesting technology and not because you can't do great things with it. You, you can. I just hate it because it represents this like failure of Google. Oh, I'm glad we asked you. It's a very honest take on the on uh, one potential future of Flutter and how it might not be the best. Okay, thank you. I've, yeah, I've been very loud about it in the past and sort of like notorious. I, when I worked at Google, I got in trouble all the time for, for saying I hate Flutter and criticizing their technological choices. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Um, that, that's really insightful. Thank you. So I have one more question to wrap up. But before I get to that, does anyone have a burning question before I ask my last one? Okay, in that case, last question. I'd love to hear from each of you. Um, we have a class of aspiring Android developers, or at least some of them will, are aspiring Android developers. What practical advice would you give them to become you know, the tech lead, the expert Android that each of you are? What actionable steps would you recommend them to take right now in order to be that Android expert in a few years? Anyone? None, of, none of us know. <laughs> no one has an answer to that. <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead and go. Um, what I'm going to say is just cultivate your curiosity. So just find everything curious if you can. I mean, it sounds very elementary, but it really is. Um, if you can find, uh, you know, as Jake was mentioning, Jetpack Compose, if you're not familiar with it, just Go take a look at it. Be curious. Ask yourself, what is this? Start diving into it. And this kind of goes across the all, you know, chasms of of software development. If you're interested in, you know, NoSQL databases, then if that's where you're you want to go, then go there. I mean, when I started off in my software engineering or IT career, you could say I wasn't going after software. I started as a network engineer. Um, I learned low level binary math to help fix Cisco routers. Like, that's what I did. And I fell into software and, and found out and just had curiosity and let that drive me. And I've just let new things, if I'm interested in something, I'll just go explore it and learn about it. And that's just kind of how I've progressed through my career. Uh, and it's worked out very well for me. And just uh, as soon as you stop finding something interesting or fun, go look for something fun and interesting again. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I kind of want to echo what Don said and what Alex was saying before about how, you know, he, he just sort of, um, like, he was the lead because people called him the lead. Uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's just, I don't call myself an Android expert, but I think, you know, like, none of us were actually looking to be Android experts. I think all of us basically followed our interests. We followed, like Don said, our curiosity. We, we followed sort of like the things that we were interested in. Um, and I, I think it's, it's very difficult to go wrong when you, when you, when you do that, um, you know, is like, I, I think, you know, like you all are deep in Silicon Valley, like maybe you have friends who are a couple years older who are millionaires now. Um, but, you know, I, I think if you, come out of school being like, I'm going to choose this company because it's going to make me a millionaire. I, you know, I think most of the time that's going to lead you down the wrong path. Um, you know, I think it's like 
software is not going, you know, going away and, you know, it's, it, it can like literally lead you anywhere. Um, and so really just think about the things that you are passionate about, um, find companies whose values align with your own. Um, and I think that's the place that you're going to flourish. Um, and that's the place that, you know, I think like you're going to see yourself grow because you're doing something that you're interested in. You're doing something that you're passionate about and you're doing it with people, um, whom, you know, sort of like, like I said, you have values that align with. And I think that's really powerful. Um, and it was something that I learned a lot later in my career. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. My advice here, um, a bit of a different lane. Um, yeah, definitely it's important to like follow your passion and be curious, but my core piece of advice, and I think this is the main thing that makes great software engineers great is to be selfless. I firmly believe that pretty much all the good engineering behaviors stem from that value. Um, like just to go through a bunch of examples, um, the reason I try to write good code uh, is to make sure that the experience for my fellow developers is like, is positive, right? Like people are going to be reading and iterating on my code in the future. And I don't want them to be like, wow, this, this code sucks. It's like mentally and physically hurts me like reading through this code. And the reason I, you know, extensively test all my code, I, you know, test RTL, write tests, uh, test inter like Android API levels is because I care about delivering like shipping love and shipping quality to our users. Cause like in the end we're building a product to solve problems and we want to make sure that when people use the products, they have as good experience as possible. And the reason I review as more code than anyone in my org is because I, you know, feel the pain of being blocked. So I want to enable my you know, fellow teammates to ship code, ship love, ship quality as fast as possible. So I think once you have that kind of guiding light of like, I just want to like be as selfless as possible and help as many people as possible, like all the good engineering behaviors will naturally stem from there. Hey, Jake, do you want to bring us home? I, I mean, it's hard to say. It's hard to add anything to those three really great answers. Uh, you know, to be the best Android engineer, um, you want to be the, you, you just want to target, uh, like, yeah. I, I mean, I'm just going to sum up what other people said. Um, everything you learn in engineering is going to make you better at every aspect of engineering, uh, whether it's, server development, web development, client development, different languages, uh, you're going to be able to take things away from that and bring it back to whatever platform you're working on, even if it's something completely different. So the things you learn everywhere uh, are just going to make you a better engineer in general. And so, you know, becoming the best Android engineer or, or you know, a, a tech lead for Android um, should be two things. It should be about you just becoming a better engineer in general. And then having an interest in Android, uh, you know, the following your curiosity thing is you really don't want to have to force it. Um, you know, it's, it's even if iOS represents a small subset of Did we lose the market Jay? that, you know, the, the company that you interest in more. I mean, for Android, for me, it's the thing I have in my pocket, and that's why it's more interesting. I can build that. Sir? Oh, I can, we can hear you now. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, just, like, try and be the best general engineer and then follow the things which are going to make you want to be the better engineer. Very well said. Okay, I know we're at time. I want to thank each of the panelists so, so much on behalf of the whole class. I think the fact that you spent an hour and a half with us is really meaningful. Um, so I really appreciate the time that you gave. I know we have some hard stops at six. So thanks again. I'll stick around um, if there are any other questions, but um, thanks everyone for putting in all the work for the whole class. Um, and I'll leave my contact information um, if you want to connect even after this quarter ends. But thank you. Bye. Yeah, thanks everyone thanks for, having, for us. having us. Yeah, thanks everyone.